Um, it's a pleasure to be here in beautiful Taiwan um, and, uh, and such. So nonetheless, uh, <clears throat> so let me introduce uh, some of the aspects associated with uh, our project. Uh, a lot of the way I present things is to give a lot of philosophy behind what we're doing. Um, and I can always uh, back it up with a lot of the details. I tend to like my actions to talk more than my words. Um, but this is one example in which I give you some philosophies on how we're doing and why I think the approach that we're doing is um, uh, a, a valuable uh, uh, approach out there. So <clears throat> let me first introduce uh, our mission. Uh, so we're implementing a community-built OER platform that is comprehensive and can be curated at multiple levels. So each of those words that start with C is exceedingly important for what we're doing. So we're trying to build a community, uh, and this essentially means you. Uh, and that community is not necessarily the OER community, but it's the greater academic community. And uh, I'm fortunate in that I wear multiple hats. So uh, I'm, I'm the executive director and founder of the LibreTex project, uh, but I'm also a uh, active uh, chemistry professor. Uh, so the OER content that we use, I actively use in my classroom. Uh, and I'm also a co-chair of an OER project that's being formed in my campus at, at UC Davis um, uh, that is uh, pushing it to a very large uh, community. So I wear three different hats and that gives us a unique uh, perspective, I think, than um, many other projects out there. <clears throat> um, uh, we have OER platform. I'm going to just refer to that as free um, since we are, uh, we know a lot more about OER. We know that's not exactly the proper definition of that, but let's just keep it at that for now. Um, and they can be curated. And I don't know why the arrow doesn't go to curated. Uh, we basically follow a no gap left behind policy. Uh, so we don't focus on content that is the lower divisional or the content that's only just the classes that have a certain amount of enrollment um, that we cover everything from start to finish, depending upon what your context of that. And we've used content uh, on our site uh, at graduate levels and even have uh, some um, primary campuses that are using it. We follow a no tech left behind policy. So any valid open source uh, technology that we're able to capitalize on and integrate into our system, uh, we do so gladly as long as it has a, at least some level of utility off of it. And then it's comp, uh, okay, this is, this is why it's changed. I, I erased a couple words and then moved around. So curated should be, it's a living library. Um, so that, that would be the opposite of a dead library, for example, a links uh, or a, a platform or a repository of PDFs would be an example of a dead repository. And it's important in order to be able to curate content because OER content, like all academic content, uh, starts to age. And then we need to have a mechanism in order to do that. So what is the LibreTex project? Well, we're a construction platform and it provides the opportunity in order to build uh, <clears throat> OER content. Uh, and we are a dissemination platform. In fact, I'll argue we're the most popular dissemination platform on the net today. Um, uh, and we're a learning platform, uh, which is a mechanism in order to, uh, for students to capitalize on our content in order to learn effectively and also to, to be utilized by faculty off these things. But uh, we have a bigger picture uh, out there. So the term LibreTex was originally designed in order to focus on OER open textbooks. Um, we've expanded that scope uh, because the concept of a textbook is changing uh, rapidly. Uh, and it's much more than just a, a physical book that we used to give in the past. Uh, and then we need other ancillary materials in order to focus on the textbook of the future. Uh, <clears throat> so we have a core set of libraries, uh, about 13 libraries, 14, 15, depending on how you look at, focusing on different uh, fields out there. But we have ancillary components necessary in order to push this textbook of the future. We have a homework infrastructure. We have a Jupyter Notebook book in order to embed executable code, which is important for STEM-based fields. We have Java server in order to uh, host, JavaScript server in order to host uh, content uh, or technology as it uh, evolves. Learning analytics infrastructure in order to push the learning platform. A bot server in order to be able to go through our platform because it is a curatable platform. It gives us the ability in order to update our content to handle uh, modern and emerging um, accessibility requirements. We have a learning management system, which I don't know why it's called TMS here. We have forums that facilitate communication of the community. Um, and uh, we actually have two flavors of homework system, one formative and one summative. And this formative, uh, the summative one is uh, based around uh, implementing adaptive learning and uh, culturally responsive uh, pedagogy. Uh, and if anyone's interested, I can certainly talk about that, but that's not a focus of what uh, this thing here. The key point off of what we're doing is that, uh, A, we're nonprofit. So we're not trying to make money off of this thing. 
Um, we understand that some revenue is necessary for sustainability, um, but uh, we all have day jobs because we're all in academics and, and most of us are faculty and use the content off of that. So it means that we're very faculty centered in the way that we do things. Um, <clears throat> and that does give a different perspective than projects that are more librarian perspective or more publishing perspective, or even just basically very commercialized in order to be able to game the system in order to, to make a profit off of that. Uh, and these are two key aspects that I feel quite strongly that is necessary in order to push both our project and I think the, o, the greater OER project. I know not everyone, OER uh, effort. I know not everyone agrees with that, but that's our approach. Okay, so the Babson uh, survey uh, identified a range of different reasons why people don't use OER. Um, so uh, one is the just the sheer number of OER uh, out there, uh, the difficulty in order to find uh, OER, uh, the difficulty in order to catalog OER constructively, uh, and then other ancillary materials in order to supplement that OER textbook, including the homework system and other support stuff. Uh, and the, the key point of building this Libreverse is to try to address all these issues within a single infrastructure that we have control over and that we're able to push things forward. So the way I view uh, OER is through conflict theory. So I'm a very much the glass is half full kind of guy. <clears throat> uh, so I view that intrinsically, this is a competition between big publishers that have a lot of infrastructure it established in order to, um, to you know, profit and do everything, which largely is a motivation for a lot of OER uh, efforts, but not all OER efforts. And fortunately, in the last few years, there have been lots of small uh, or even uh, medium-sized uh, projects that have been funded across the globe uh, in order to be able to deal with this. But the problem is that they don't have a centralized standard, a centralized format. Uh, even communication is sometimes limited, although this uh, meeting is a, one example of a mechanism in order to facilitate that. Uh, <clears throat> this is one mechanism, and I, I feel, in order to compete constructively with the big fish in the sea where everyone works together. Anyone who's been in academia for any period of time knows that that's never gonna happen um, just because the very nature of how academics uh, operate um, or if you're outside of academia, how for-profit uh, entities operate. So our approach is to build a bigger fish, is to take everything, put it together into a central infrastructure, a warehouse of sorts. Um, but I don't like using that term because we're far stronger than just a simple repository in order to be able to compete with the publisher. And that means building all the components in order to build to support the textbook of the future. So. Um, let me skip over this uh, and talk about just briefly some of the philosophy of what we're doing here. So we bring everything into, uh, or we, we build content and we harvest content, which is our term of taking existing OER and bringing it to our platform, capitalizing on the O in OER uh, and the permissions afforded by largely uh, common, Creative Commons, although other licenses do provide that support too. To, uh, and bring it into an infrastructure that's curatable and centrally uh, localized. And that's a bit of effort. But the key point is that when we want students to graduate uh, in whatever respective institutions we want, we want the synergy of their learning uh, to be manifested. Uh, so in other words, we want them to understand how some concepts in some fields uh, relate to other concepts in other fields. So the synergy of what they're learning, even though we teach in silos, we want something much more comprehensive. And my argument is that if we want that to be instilled into our students, we need to give them the resource that reflects that synergy, that connection. So we stop talking about building individual textbooks and start talking about building text libraries, interconnected knowledge bases that are able to reflect it. You carve out certain sections for a silo because we still teach in classes, but you benefit from the, uh, the, the massive network behind the infrastructure uh, behind here. And that's essentially arguing that the textbooks reflect how we want our students to see the world. Now in constructing any sort of project uh, like what we're doing here, we have several different approaches that can be uh, constructed. One is a centralized approach and the other one is a decentralized approach. Uh, and you can have sort of mixtures of the two off of here. And there are benefits and detractions off of that. The centralized approach gives you high stability and high fidelity. Uh, it's effective sharing. Uh, it, it's a, it provides pooled resources uh, and it's a very efficient way in order to operate. Uh, so that would be an example of using essentially anything Google related uh, that's uh, centralized uh, off of that. <clears throat> uh, its cons is it typically provides lack of local control um, and that's local control from the base level all the way up to the top level or to mid medium level. Um, a decentralized approach uh, would be for example, making software that you can then port on your individual campuses or your individual computers. Uh, you can run and, and implement effectively. It provides flexibility. Uh, it has several cons. It, it perpetuates what I refer to as a fragmented ecosystem. Um, 
that it's all these individual OER projects in various spots that don't talk to each other very well and results in inefficient progress moving forward in the general community because people are oftentimes replicating the wheel. Moreover, it hinders the ability to remix one of the key components of OER. Um, it requires independent resources. Uh, it's inefficient. Um, and, and even though the code, free and open source software, may be free, it's not free to implement. You still need servers, you still need IT, uh, and this idea that you own the pipeline from your server to your computer is largely uh, not real uh, either because you have to pay ISP and, and other things like that. So there's a lot of issues that I feel that the fragmented ecosystem that's oftentimes pursued in terms of individualized efforts is necessary. And I want to be able to generate a platform, and this is what the LibreTex is doing, in order to provide the positive components of the centralized platform and the positive components of the decentralized platform while neglect. Uh, negating or at least reducing these red uh, terms. So let me give you a little bit uh, of an uh, aspect on the impact. Uh, if you are a chemist and you Googled anything in chemistry, it is physically, it's not physically, it's virtually impossible to avoid a Google search of LibreText. And that applies to a great deal of other Google searches out there. Um, so we're the most popular OER platform on the net today in terms of traffic. Uh, we've distributed 520 million, uh, so over a half a billion page views since we started. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, and you'll notice that, that COVID basically bumped us up uh, by 100% growth in the last couple of months, uh, which is not un, uh, unreasonably expected and other projects have expressed or demonstrated similar activities. So we're somewhere in the order of a million page views delivered per day. 45% of our traffic is in America, uh, so the other 55% uh, of our traffic is outside uh, the uh, side of America, uh, with India being our second largest. And they're largely uh, countries that have uh, English as a native language or lingua franca, so largely Commonwealth countries uh, out there. And I can show you distribution if people are interested off of that. So <clears throat> what you'll notice here when I'm talking about impacts is I'm not talking about money. Um, I, I have a pet peeve in terms of trying to quantify OER content and turn to money because I'm an educator. Uh, I don't care about the money perspective. The money perspective is only a problem because it adversely affects my mission as an instructor in the classroom. The students are not purchasing the book. Don't purchase the book, then it has a detrimental effect on my educational mission. That is the only reason I care about money. What I do care about is how uh, students use the resource, uh, how it augments their educational mission, how many, uh, for example, how many years, or in this case here, four millennia of uh, confirmed students the reading, and the analytics behind the learning, not the analytics around the, the money. Uh, and that's my perspective, but I think it's the valid perspective in terms of what uh, OER is out there. So if you look at any of our libraries, and this is an example of the chemistry library, uh, when you log in, actually not when you log in, when you just look at anonymously, you have two different categories. You have the stuff that's in the bookshelves and the stuff that's in the courses. This, this reflects this centralization, decentralization approach that we have here, where we have canonical content stored in our bookshelves, whether it's the content we've constructed, content that we harvested, um, and invariably, whether it's constructed or harvested, we're constantly curating the content in order to move forward. And then we have the courses where individual campuses have individual hubs, and individual hubs have individual courses, and individual courses oftentimes have individual faculty to customize, remix, and match, and build whatever they want, and have the control, the flexibility that they want uh, outside here. So while it's centralized, we do not curate this content with the exception of running bots and cleaning things up in order to make sure that things follow a center standard. But we have the content in the bookshelves uh, as the canonical repository of things. So we have somewhere in the order of about 750 books that are in the bookshelves. I want to mention this very clearly. Actually, I'll, I'll be showing it in a moment here uh, with a new slide. Um, so I mentioned that the uh, OER universe is fragmented. This is an example of that. You can find content or links of content uh, in the Open Textbook Library. I need to make sure that I'm seeing chats in case I'm, I'm supposed to be going quickly. Thank you. Uh, uh, we have, um, uh, you can find content, uh, uh, um, you find links to content in the Open Textbook Library, which is largely a library guide. OER Commons, which is more of a referatory with some repository stuff. O OpenStax, uh, why am I not uh, moving here? Uh, Merlot, Open Sunny, Galileo, Open Oregon, Nova, BC Campus, uh, Ontario, uh, Alberta, Hawaii, Sailor, uh, Affordable Learning Solutions, and there's a whole slew of other content out there. So there's a need in order to centralize content, which is what we're doing. We forgot about Oregon. So what we are doing, or at least part of our thrusts uh, off of here, is to take content um, and make it available in order to build effectively. Um, and that building effectively is not just building from scratch, but to remix from existing content. So whenever you're building anything from scratch, you need to decide what your platform is uh, off of there. So if you're building a 
house or something like that, you can build them Tinker Toys or Lego, uh, uh, Lego Babies, Lincoln Blocks, Duplos, Legos, Erector Sets. Uh, and you can, you can mop in various formats of websites, LaTeX, uh, um, PDFs, et cetera, uh, if you want to make this analogy into the OER engine. What we are doing is we're taking the content, uh, oftentimes PDFs or other things, we rip them apart, bring them into our platform, uh, it's a database you then can go in and edit, modify, curate, and move forward, while PDFs, for example, are a dead format that do not enable that. So we go through this effort so that the community doesn't have to worry about that. They can actually capitalize on it. So you come in into a Lego store, and you can come in and you can pick and choose things effectively, and we build technology in order to enable that, in order to build a book uh, uh, useful. So we dissect assisting OER, we integrate into libraries, uh, uh, and then we, stand, we spend a lot of effort standardizing the existing formats. So the key point here is that when we harvest content, we're not just storing a PDF off of there. We're doing going through a lot of effort to rip it apart, uh, convert all equations into the LaTeX, make sure the format's all established, make sure it's easy in order to cut and paste. Because anyone who's ever tried to cut and paste a PDF, for example, into a document understands the pain of going from one format to another format. Now, we also have standardization of meta tags in order to be able to uh, allow more powerful approaches off of that. Um, <clears throat> So we have a handful of advanced features, uh, visualization capabilities, uh, embedding uh, executable code via our Jupyter Notebook system. Um, I want to skip over the community thing. I just mentioned a, a, a one last few comments here. So we have this greater li Libreverse here, um, uh, but its utility as a dissemination mechanism is only dictated by the dissemination tools that we have off of that. So we can disseminate into learning management systems, into mobile phones, um, uh, or we'll have an app that'll be coming out in a few months in order to do that. But directly to LibreText, we have a LibreText in the box, uh, which is a Raspberry Pi hotspot for developing countries where you can just basically get it and get the whole library that you have available. We have 300,000 pages of content uh, out there or physical books. So any content that we have on our site, uh, we have the ability in, that's compiled uh, to be able to let anyone purchase a physical book. Uh, so for my general chemistry book, it's normally $300 and now uh, let students, if they want to purchase it for $12 plus shipping, they can go about doing that. And that's perfectly fine. Uh, and you can see that right now of over 1,200 books, remixes and uh, uh, books. So it's centrally located, it's available for rapid on printing demand. Uh, we just basically take the money and hand it off to the printer. We're not taking any money off of that. That way we don't have to conflict with non-commercial clauses on, uh, on the content. Uh, and it can be branded and, and dynamic for faculty instructors. This is an example of that general chemistry textbook that I'm going to be using next quarter um, out there. Um, I mentioned LibreText in a box. So this is a Raspberry Pi box. Uh, it costs about $45. Uh, and you can load it with the entire uh, LibreText libraries. You can ship it off to a developing country. You can ship it off to a submarine underneath the ocean. It could be in the uh, in the Andes. Uh, and as long as you have a Wi-Fi enabled device, you can then get access to all the content out there with a lot of the JavaScript capabilities that's available off of that. So let me conclude with uh, mentioning again, we're implementing a community built OER platform that's comprehensive and curated at multiple levels. Uh, uh, hopefully you find us useful. Um, uh, and what we're doing uh, with that I should mention where we got our support, which is largely from uh, federal agencies, both from the state of California and from NSF, from the Department of Education that's responsible in order to move our project forward. Because our belief is that OER is part of our educational mission, which means it's part of the mandate of our governments in order to support. Um, with that, I thank you for your attention.